The IMG Roadmap is the only podcast dedicated to coaching international medical graduates and success blueprints for this unique pathway. I am Dr. Nina Loom, your host, a previous IMG turned hospital medicine physician, healthcare administrator, speaker, and coach. I empower, encourage, and equip you with actionable steps that you can take towards the residency position of your dreams. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the IMG Robot Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Nasir. She is a phenomenal IMG who was just telling me off air how much this <laughs> podcast helped her. And so I thought this would be the perfect person to come on and share with us what kind of help she received and more importantly, how the lessons that she's learned can benefit you, the listener, okay? Because once upon a time, she was listening just like you. And now here she is coming back to give back in a sense to share what she has learned and how it helped her and even things that she didn't learn on the podcast. She's here to share her story so you can be inspired. And one day, hopefully you can also come on and be the next guest, right? That's the whole point. Welcome, Dr. Nasir. How are you doing today? Hi, Dr. Long. Thank you so much. And uh, it is still so unbelievable that I'm on the other side now. <laughs> but uh, I keep thanking God every day. I want to thank you, the podcast, and just every piece of little advice that I got from you every now and then. I think it all helped me a lot. I am so happy to hear that. And you are very welcome. It's my pleasure. It's amazing how the IMG community is so united, even though we're so far away, we're separated by distance and country of origin and all these other things, but we relate with one another and can so easily understand the pain that another person expresses, right? Like yes. it's almost as if you, you know exactly where that shoe fits. So you know where it mm. hurts. Yeah. And that is why, you know, uh, I, I, like I decided to come on the podcast because I know that there are so many people, you know, I don't care about what country they're coming from, what color they're of, but I know that they're IMGs and they're like, you know, I'm one of them. So I have to help them out in whatever way I can. Yeah, absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. So tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, what makes you an mm -hmm. IMG, give us some background. Sure. So my full name is Pariha Nasser. I am from originally from Pakistan. I graduated in 2019 from Islamabad Medical and Dental College, which is in the capital of Pakistan. I am going to join my residency in internal medicine at Harlem Hospital Center, New York on 1st July. And um, I'm currently on a J-1 visa. So yeah, that's pretty much about it. <laughs> Yeah, that J-1 visa, I know all of that. I had a visa too. Oh. But, you know, before we get into the visa talk, let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about some challenges that you face. Because you were just saying, you know, I can't believe I'm yes. here. I'm, I can't believe I'm on the other side of this. <laughs> so can you yeah. tell us, like, what those challenges were and why did you ever think that it was not possible? What were the threats in your life? So, I mean, I always knew from towards the end of my med school that this is what I was going to do. But there were still so many challenges. First of all, when I began this journey, I did not have too much guidance, you know. That's why I want, I like, you know, I appreciate the podcast, the IMG podcast so much because I came toward do it a bit later in my journey. So in the beginning, uh, one of the problems that I had to face was that I did not have too much guidance. And because of which I feel like my scores were, I wouldn't say they were low, but they were just average scores. And there was a point when I used to think that because of these scores, I might just not match, you know, but then things did end up working, <laughs> working out for me. And I did end up matching in my first try. So yeah. Yeah, you know, I get that message mm -hmm. all the time from other IMGs. Like actually today I was scrolling on Instagram mm -hmm. and, and someone sent me a text, a, DM, a direct message. And they said, you know, Dr. Loom, do you think I stand a chance to match into internal mm -hmm. medicine at a university program or something like that, that they worded it. And they sent me their score performance and mm -hmm. everything. And I'm like, go ahead and apply. Like, yeah, there's no way for me. You know, I wish I had a magic ball. Yeah, I <laughs> tell you that your scores are poor and you shouldn't apply. 
But that's yeah. so inaccurate, especially now that we're moving towards a more holistic approach to viewing yes. the applicant. Your score and, shouldn't hold you back. Can you talk? And about I that? think they don't because what I did was that I had like towards the end of the cycle, I had like nine to 10 months of US clinical experience. And I think that helped me a lot. And that even brought out my application a lot to the programs. So even if something has happened, you know, let's say you do have an average score, but you want to go to IM or some other competitive speciality, then you just work your way through it, you know, and you will never know unless you try. So you have to apply, you have to try. And just one thing that I want to say, a lot of people focus on university programs and everything. And I get that everybody has their own preferences, but I think it's just important to get into the system, to get matched. And I just want people to understand that, you know, to come into the match with a very open mind, you know, that it doesn't matter where, because that's how the whole process is made, you know, like you don't even know where you have matched. So just keep an open mind. It does not matter if you match into a university program or a small community, a community program, your focus should be on matching. Yeah, you know, I, I shared that sentiment in the sense mm-hmm. that, you know, I think there's some IMGs that are located outside of the States, right? Mm-hmm. And so their understanding of the United States medical educational system could be limited. Yes, because I have true. some IMGs that will send me a message and say, I want to match at Mayo Clinic. I want to match at Harvard. And, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, realistically, Harvard will, could take an IMG, but you'll have to work so much harder exactly. just to get the name of the school. But because you're in the U.S., you can get pretty competitive training, even in a community-based program, yes. and still get into a fellowship, even if you don't go to Harvard. And, and so... I try yeah. to tell I am just this, but it's almost like, how do you just, how do you say that in a, in a direct message on Instagram and encourage them as long if a program is accredited by the ATGME, they have the authority to train and produce an internal medicine resident. And it's up to that resident to then train themselves and equip themselves for whatever fellowship that they want. Exactly. And they can get that fellowship yeah. provided that they put in the work during residency, no matter where they're trained. And almost all the attendings who I have worked with, uh, all the internists or, you know, cardiologists or everybody, they would always tell me, they, they always said, they said, it, nobody's ever going to ask you, oh, where did you do your residency from, you know? And it's so true. Nobody is ever going to ask. So as an IMG, you know, our focus, I'm sorry to say this, but I just say this as an example. Beggars cannot be choosers, you know. We already have so many. That's what I keep telling my other friends too, you know. We already have such limited options. Why limit it, limit it even more by saying, oh, I just want to go to a university program. And that was funny because <laughs> I, I know that phrase so well, so beggars can be choosers. I like it. Yeah. So, I mean, I I encourage, I think what we're trying to say for those listening, if, you know, I don't want you guys to feel there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to Harvard or Mayo Clinic to train in internal medicine. Those are great facilities, but Mm. you have physicians that train at Mayo Clinic and still come out and work in a community center, just like everybody else. Okay. And you have physicians that go to Harvard and they become the best in the specialty, but you also have physicians that go to a community center and become the best in the specialty. So it's all based on how much work you're putting into it and how much time you're spending training yourself alongside of what you're receiving during residency. So it's just not about what your residency program is giving you. It's what are you also bringing to the table? Mm, Names are great, but for IMGs, I know IMGs who are making a name for themselves without having that background. So oh. what's what's their excuse, right? Yeah, that was such a good thing that you said, you know. For us, it's I think it's more about making our own name than affiliating our name to a big program. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. I'm all about creating your own medical success story, right? That's yes. that's what I, I preach and that's what I share about on my Instagram, my online mm-hmm. course. It's all about focusing on what is your definition of success? Given yes. your circumstances, how can you mold yourself to be the best possible physician that you can be in what you want to do? Mm-hmm. How do you define that? Success is defined by you. You, you exactly. know, it's, it, a school, a name doesn't define your success. If that was yeah. the case, then I am just could never be successful because so one stand the ranks, right? Yeah. 
everybody yeah. has their own definition of success you know for me coming from pakistan like you know getting through all these hurdles matching at harlem for me this is everything for me like i could not ask god for more so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely i i hear you so you did mention that you had you know because before the podcast usually for mm-hmm. those who don't know I send out a questionnaire to mm-hmm. the guest that's coming on and I usually ask them about the challenges that they overcame mm-hmm. just to make sure that we have a good fair share of, you know, different opinions on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that you said was, you know, overcoming average scores with a good and interesting application. Mm-hmm. And then you also mentioned some other points like personal statement, clinical rotation, yeah. and we'll talk about the visa a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. Can you go in depth as to what you meant by you know, a good and interesting application mm-hmm. or overcoming average scores? Yeah. So for the application, uh, what I would say is try to keep it as short as possible because a program is getting 5,000 to 6,000 applications, you know, and they might just glance at your application. So the one thing that they glance at should come off as very, you know, interesting and, you know, it should just get their attention. So people who are applying would know that, you know, when you put your information into ERAS, like all the clinical rotation, it asks you to describe it. So what I described in each of my, each single my, of one of my clinical rotations was that I would write a little bit about, you know, about the EMR that I use, because maybe the hospital that is reading your application is using the same EMR. So they'd be like, oh, you know, this person would be a good match for us. And then at the same time, I would write about some of the cases that I saw or, you know, something about the location or something like that. So that's just a little thing that I did. But then again, try to keep your application as short as possible. I know people whose ERS application is like 60, 70 pages long, and it just doesn't make sense. Because, I mean, I know there are people who have a lot of experience, but just try to understand that the like, you know, the program directors or the recruitment committees, they don't have that much time to read every single application. And secondly, what I meant by interesting was that when it comes to hobbies, like, you know, I talked to a lot of people before uh, submitting my application and everybody told me that, you know, mostly they do ask you about your hobbies and stuff. So I made, so make sure what I did was I chose three hobbies And in front of each one of them, I wrote a one line sentence. So my first one was that I keep a fashion diary. And then I just wrote that I go through my fashion diary every now and then to see uh, how my personal style has evolved. You know, uh, so one of the programs and every single program where I interviewed, they bought it up because it was something different, you know, because when everybody is writing, writing hiking or watching Netflix, there is somebody who's like, you know, who's bringing something else to the table. So each and every place where I interviewed, that question was asked that, oh, we want to know about this diary. And so then one program they mentioned, they said that, you know, by this thing that you have written, that, you know, how your style has evolved, it just shows to us that you're a person who likes to see growth. And I never even thought about it. It was the program who mentioned it to me. And I was like, oh, wow, it does make sense. So, you know, just try to add those things to your application that the program finds different from other applicants. Yeah, I love that. I love that because usually things like even the hobby section, I noticed that some IMGs just ignore it because they think it's not a big deal, especially if you come from a culture where hobbies are not um, <laughs> I em- <know>. emphasized. <laughs> like I come from a very like a culture where like hobbies are not a thing. I- and I don't Same. mean that in a bad way. Like obviously yeah. the affluent people, the richer people, they had hobbies, right? Mm. <laughs> but most people yeah. wake up in the morning and just want to survive. Y- you don't wake up thinking about a hobby. But I when know. you move over here, you realize that that's a key point that you can use to actually connect with somebody else. And other people look at hobbies as a representation of who you are, right? Like, for example, I went on an interview one time after I became an attending Mm -hmm. and I was being asked about my hobbies. And I said, I have this podcast. And they actually looked me up and saw that I had a podcast and they were so impressed with the fact that I was willing to give back. And so guess what? They automatically thought I was a very altruistic person before I even came to the interview. Just because of their interpretation of what this podcast represents, right? And so I noticed that that's an area where I think when I was doing my residency application, I didn't even put a hobby down because 
I probably thought it was useless. <laughs> I probably <laughs> thought it, nobody cared. But now I notice those are areas that people are just trying to know a little bit more about you besides the CV. They want yeah. to see like your personality and especially in the virtual world. Yeah, those exactly. little things count. Those yeah, they things just, count. yeah, they just want to know that, you know, you're a normal person who also likes <laughs> yeah. to enjoy their life. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Like they just want to know you're a normal person. That's so true. Yeah. And so, then um, yeah. other than that, I think if you have, uh, you know, average scores or something like that, it's good to have U.S. clinical experience and it doesn't matter where it is. All of my experience was just in outpatient clinics, all my letters, my LORs, none of them were from, you know, like hospital or university LORs. They were just from just some attendings who were working at their clinics, but they were obviously affiliated with hospitals. So I think every little thing counts. Every little thing counts. A hundred percent agree with that. So let's talk about the other section of the questionnaire that you filled Mm -hmm. out. You mentioned personal statements and clinical rotations being a sort of a challenge that you had to deal with. Can you share a little bit of light on that? Yeah. So once again, coming towards guidance, I literally, like literally 20 to 25 days before the application, I realized that, you know, my personal statement was just not up to the mark because I literally had no guidance for it. So, you know, then I, obviously I did some research, I reached out to some people and another reason why I really appreciate your podcast, Dr. Alum, is because I think it's just so inexpensive, <laughs> you know, it's so affordable for people, you know, even if you want to sign up for the interview courses or anything, it's just very, very, very affordable because when I was reaching out to other people for my personal statement, they would ask for like 500 or 800 or something, which is, you know, a bit too much. And literally, so I was like, I was struggling a lot, but then I ended up uh, talking to this person who is an AMG actually, but she did her anesthesia from Harvard and she was nice enough to help me with my personal statement for free. And she turned like, it was my story. Everything was my own, but she just helped me with the right wording and everything. So yeah, just try to help people as much as you can. (laughs) Absolutely. I agree with that. I really try to make sure that the services that I offer IMGs you know, are well within their reach. And no, they I are, definitely they go are, way above me. and beyond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So yeah. let's talk a little bit more about the section where you mentioned your visa requirement. So I know that for me, being a visa mm-hmm. applicant, I felt like that was a hindrance because I felt like I didn't have as many programs to apply into. Mm-hmm. Such when you look at the score cutoff and all the other yes. nuances. So how did you navigate that? Like how many programs did you apply to? How many interviews did you get? Mm -hmm. So obviously since I'm visa requiring, there was obviously limited options. And um, this was my first match. So I applied to 150 programs uh, for internal medicine. Internal medicine is the only specialty that I applied to. And so my list was basically, uh, first of all, so what here's what I did let's say one month before the application end line date, when I was making my list, I called programs. I was emailing programs. I was calling them, asking for their requirements. And there were so many programs who actually replied me at that time. And later, when I emailed those programs that I am interested, I actually got an interview from a program So it's really good to stay in touch with programs from the very beginning, let's say August. So that's how I made my list. I emailed programs, I called programs, every program who was responding me and saying that I meet their requirements, I applied there. Because I know that, you know, we all have very limited resources being IMGs. So I was making sure that, you know, my 150 programs are the programs where I will get in. However, towards the end, I did apply into some programs where I was not meeting the cutoff scores, but I still applied. And I had a total of four interviews. And so I'm just going to share an experience which might help people. So I got an advice from some people, actually another AMG, 
who told me that, you know, just call programs, call programs, email programs, ask them for an interview. So I was at first, I was like, I don't know. But then like two, three weeks passed by and I had only one interview. So I was like, okay, I maybe I should start calling programs. So basically, here's another thing. I was very much, let's say, location oriented because my family lives in Philadelphia. So I did apply to other states, but my main focus was the Northeast, like Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York. So all of the programs over here, I made sure I was reaching out to them because, you know, every time I called them, I told them, oh, I live here with my family, so I would love to stay here. So I actually called a program very close to where I was staying and I didn't even meet their score cutoff but I still called them I and the coordinator picked up and I told her and she said oh we haven't viewed your application because I didn't mean make the cutoff so they filtered me out but so I told her I was like oh well I live 20 minutes away from the program and I would just love to stay here so she was like okay I'll see what we can do for you and the next day, I got an interview from them. And it's a very good program. It's an amazing program. So and I was like, oh, my God. So, you know, reach out to programs, call them, email them. I probably called like 100 programs and like two or three picked up. But still, I got an interview out of that. And then there was another program who I sent a letter of interest. And the next day, I got an interview. So, you know... Choose your words very wisely when you're sending out emails for interests. Let them know that you live over here, like, you know, in the nearby area, why you are interested in that program. It's very easy to say to the program, I'm interested, please send me an interview or I'd like to interview with you. But you have to tell them why you are interested. Is it the location? Is it the faculty? Is it due to a personal reason? And I think if the programs see that, you know, you genuinely like them, you're genuinely interested, then they obviously they do get back to you. I like that because I think that that's a very strong suit with networking, yes. being able to present yourself and, and literally kind of shoot your shot, basically. <laughs> I know. But then I've noticed with IMGs, you know, because I get a lot of communication from IMGs, like mm-hmm. they'll send me messages and such. They'll send a message and just and try it's almost as if there's no thought there's no thinking behind it like oh I'm just can you can you help can you mentor me or I like your program okay then what right exactly like you need to give the person that you're reaching out to something to work with if that makes any sense so you can't just show up yeah yeah. you have to be very wise with your words with what you're saying right right so you can't just show up and say hey I need I like your program okay everybody does moving on that's that's literally what's happening when you say that as opposed to I'm interested in matching here because this this and that it gives the person reading or listening or talking to you something else to work with beyond just the status quo that everybody else is saying how do you stand out that's the real question this one time my friend gave me a really good example so he was like imagine that the programs are a girl (laughs) and we are all guys approaching towards her, telling her that, you know, I love you. But she's obviously going to pick the guy who shows her that he loves her. So we have to go to that extra mile, make that extra effort and show them why we're interested in them. Yes, absolutely. I I use that same analogy or a similar analogy when I'm coaching my students within the Andrew Roma course. It's you're not going to just let any kind of person you know grab your attention but the person that comes to you and gives you a reason why they want to have your attention or why they want to talk to you you're more likely to keep listening because they've done their homework and so at this point they're just not showing up saying oh I want to match here no they know why they want to match here (laughs) which means if they're that intuitive to be able to be that clear on where they're going then they'll make a good fit because they know exactly what they want And that program is able to meet them where they want to be met. Yes. And another thing is like, I feel like with IMGs, I don't, I, it's obviously like, you know, there's a big communication gap. So there's this boundary line where they don't know. So when I used to call programs, I would always ask them first, you know, is it okay if I give you my ERS ID? 
mm-hmm. or like you know you have to ask them because some programs don't like it they will tell you straight up we don't communicate with candidates so you have to ask them first if they're okay with it and then you proceed right right like opening up a channel of conversation because you're not just going to walk in someone's house and badge in the front door and say give me what i want right so why do that yes. why do that virtually Ask that person for permission before you get into their personal space. I mean, I just feel like everything you're saying, these are all just nuggets that I have either like posted about or talked about. But it's like, how do you get this all together in one place so IMGs can can learn and listen? And that's why I encourage people, listen to the podcast, but don't listen to one episode or don't pick and choose. Like listen to every single story because you learn a lot from different stories, even if they're going in the trajectory that you don't want to go. So you're not looking at being a surgeon, you can listen to the surgical podcast. Or you're not looking at being an internist, but you're looking at being a surgeon, you can listen to the internal medicine podcast. Like, there's just a lot of tricks and tips that you learn. Definitely. That are just life lessons. They're not, Mm. they don't have to be very specific to where you're going. But you can definitely implement that or take the lessons and implement it and make it yours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Mm -hmm. you ended up getting four interviews and you said two of those four were through calling and emailing programs. And how, how did you feel after that? Like, did you feel like you were intruding when you were reaching out to programs or were you so confident or were you shaking in your boots? What was that like for you? I I was just happy and thankful that, you know, even if I was calling 100 programs and one was giving me an interview, I was happy. But I always made sure that I knew, you know, if I was intruding or something, you know, I always asked them if it was okay if I was calling them. And if, you know, if I didn't get a reply to my email, it's not like, you know, I kept on emailing them. But I was definitely very happy that this thing was working. And, you know, the people who advised me to do so, I thank them so much because because I mean, like if I would have got, if I would have gotten just one interview out of calling programs, I would have been happy, but imagine getting two. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm totally for you. I, I'm, I'm so proud of you that you stepped out of your comfort zone. You did not let anybody's opinion hold you back and you went for it. I mean, look at you now. You yes. were able to bet on yourself and here you are. So yeah, yeah I really appreciate that. So now, you know, after all this conversation, someone listening is going to say, hey, they want to connect with you. They want to ask you a question. Where can they find you? So they can definitely email me. My email address is Fariha, F-A-R-E-E-H-A, N-A-S-I-R Nasser at yahoo.com. Or they can reach out to me on Instagram. I can leave my link with you and you can leave it out for people if anybody wants to connect. Yeah, please. We like for you to say it so that we can also include it in the show notes. Can you Mm -hmm. tell us what your link, what your username is on Instagram? Mm -hmm. It's Fariha, F-A-R-E-E-H-A dot one, two. Okay, awesome. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Do you have any mantras that you live by? What is your your go-to when things get rough? How do you stay on top? So my mantra to get through life and I would say even the match and everything is that everything is possible for the one who believes. It's actually out of the Bible. It's Mark 9.23, but it's just what I live by. You know, if you believe in something and if you are working towards it, if you are praying for it, then it's going to happen. No matter what, it is going to happen. It doesn't matter when it will happen. It might happen a bit later or sooner, but it is going to happen. So I always believed, I always said, you know, no, I am going to match. This is going to happen. And it did happen. I have taken some very big risks. Right after I graduated in Pakistan, there's this internship for one year that we are supposed to do in order to become licensed in Pakistan. I never did it. I just gave, I just took that time off and gave my steps. So currently I'm not licensed in Pakistan too. So I was, my parents were like, you have to match. And I was like, I know I will. (laughs) Because I just believed in it and I worked hard towards it and I prayed towards it. And even one day before the match, I was talking to people and I was telling them, I know it is going to happen because I worked for it. I prayed for it and this is going to happen. And it did. So if you believe in something, just know it's going to happen. But you also have to believe in yourself and stay confident. 
Absolutely. Believe in yourself and stay confident, guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Fire. And I see we appreciate you coming on the podcast today and for sharing with us your journey, your pathway, Mm -hmm. all the way from Islamabad Medical and Dental College in Islamabad, Pakistan to Harlem, New York. We wish you the very best. We know that you'll do great things. And Mm -hmm. with the mindset that you have, I am confident that you'll get yourself to wherever you want to be because you have the mindset of a go getter. And don't <laughs> let you. that, don't let anything ever stop you. Just keep going. And thank you so much, Dr. Um, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the help that has come through you, you know, from getting my interviews to writing my emails of interest or, you know, a letter of intent, my rank order list. You have no idea. I have seen your videos. I have listened to the podcast and I actually integrated all of that into my journey. And it actually helped me, you know, Um, I picked Harlem. Uh, They were my number one choice because I actually, you know, uh, there was a video on Instagram that you uploaded about, you know, the program where you feel like, you know, you feel welcome. You feel like this is it. They want me. And that's how I felt at Harlem. I'm, I'm, I actually ran them. I matched there and I'm very happy to be joining them. So in a way I am here today because I took your advice. So thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. That makes me, I literally have goosebumps right now uh, <laughs> because, you know, I get, I tell I am all the time, they'll get in my direct messages. I'm like, if you just read through the material that I'm presenting to you. If you just take your time and read through the content that I've put out, you can get a lot out of it without even directly speaking to me. But a lot of people are lazy and they don't want to do the work and they just want you to come up in there and write their personal statement for them and take over the world and just do things for them. Like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work. I 100% agree with you because that's what I did. And even I remember for the letter of intent, your advice was just to send it to the one program that you're actually going to rank, you know, be true. And that's what I did. I only sent it to Harlem. So, you know, it's just, and you know, uh, you have a voice that is reaching out to people that is helping people. It has helped me. So I really appreciate you for taking this initiative and doing this. You're very, very welcome. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. So we wish you the very best and talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.